So today I want to do a kind of a talking off the top of my head video. I'm glad you can join me. I hope you have some time to actually be able to sit and listen to what I'm sharing with you today. It's important stuff and it's worthy of contemplation and a it's not one of those videos that you can just sort of race through and go, yeah, yeah, I know all that. Because I'm gonna be tying together some concepts that aren't frequently connected. And even though a lot of the things that I'm gonna be sharing with you appear in scripture, we haven't been able to connect them into one like coherent narrative. We have bits and pieces. We understand things in categories and systems. For instance, a lot of people who are pastors and teachers and so on believe that eschatology is sort of an optional study, that we can study salvation, soteriology. We can study uh, about all kinds of other things having to do with the Bible and theology and so on. But the study of eschatology is kind of optional. That it's not that important, that the study of salvation is the most important thing. Well, let me tell you, everything about salvation, everything about who gets saved, what they're saved to, what they're saved for, has to do with eschatology. It's all going toward an end goal that God has in mind. And the end is going to explain a lot of the things that are in the middle and including a lot of the things that happened in ages past. So this is a big view of God's plan as he's revealed it in the Bible. God's eternal spiritual plan involving spiritual beings of who uh, you and I are spiritual beings, this involves us and it's a huge gigantic plan. So I'm gonna be talking about a lot of things that I've talked about in the past. I'm gonna to be touching on some of those things and I encourage you to watch some of my previous videos, especially the one on eschatology and losing the plot. I'll leave a link to that in this video. And uh, any video that talks about sons of God, the inheritance, any of that stuff, uh, will also be important and touch on what I'm talking about today. So how I'm approaching this today is going to seem a little random if you're not familiar with uh, my teaching style and the things that I've taught in the past. But believe me, all of these little random ideas are going to be connected in a meaningful way by the end of this video, however long it is. And I'm going to be doing a follow-up video on, on death, which God has worked into the plan as a fail-safe. Death is actually, was worked into the plan. This is a bit of a wild ride, and if you're interested in adventure, I hope you'll stick around for the rest of this video. One of the ways that I know that I'm kind of onto something here is that I'm starting to get the big picture and passages that in the past um, were kind of one dimensional are now getting a very fuller dimension and I'm able to see a little bit more clearly through that dark glass that we've been viewing through. And hopefully the fog will be clearing for you too and you'll be able to see more and more about what God is doing and what his eternal plan is and how he's dealing with all of the beings that he's created, uh, including in ages past, before the actual creation of this present age that we're in right now. I do have notes. I may or may not be following the notes exactly, and those of you who've watched my videos before know I don't always go along precisely with the notes, although all the verses that I'm going to be use, using and um, the scriptural support is in the show notes. So if you're interested in knowing the verses for what I believe, um, then you can go to the show notes. So the first thing that I just want to state here is that God has, he has two families. And I just want to credit uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, the late Dr. Michael Heiser, for just 
uh, bringing this to my mind as something that needs to be part of the story is that God has two families. He has a heavenly family. He has an earthly family. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So God has a heavenly family. He has an earthly family. God's heavenly family is represented by the sons of God in the Old Testament. God has spiritual sons. Sometimes we call them angels. When God uh, wanted to talk about his sons, he called them Elohim, the Elohim. They were gods with a small g. God of course, is the Most High God, but there were these other Elohim, uh, other gods with a small g, and they existed before the creation of the world. Sometimes we use the word angel kind of interchangeably. The word angel, angelos, or malak in, in the Hebrew is, is more of a, of a role than anything else. It's the role of a messenger. Okay, so an angelos can be a human messenger. It can be Jesus as the angel of the Lord. He's the messenger of God. It can be uh, one of these spirits that is an, uh, a messenger. It denotes a role. Um, the sons of God is more about an identity. <laughs> okay, so these are the Elohim. So the Elohim or the sons of God, the spiritual heavenly family of God, is uh, has been in existence since prior to the earth being created. Job 38, 4 through 7. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who fixed its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its foundations set? Or who laid its cornerstone while all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Obviously, these are not people uh, because people had not yet been created. Psalm 89, 6, For who in the heavens shall be compared to the Lord? And who shall be likened to the Lord among the sons of God? So the sons of God, the heavenly sons of God, are are different than the Most High, than the Lord. But they have a spiritual essence, which is why they're called sons of God. The definition is someone who is a spirit being, who has a spiritual uh, component. So every son of God, every angel, is an individual creation of God. Angels do not procreate. New angels are not made by angels procreating. Every angel is a separate creation of God. Every son of God is a separate creation of God. And God created myriads and myriads and millions and thousands and who knows how many angels he created. Everyone was an individual creation. God gave every single one of them their names. He gave each one of them an assignment or a role and an area of responsibility uh, over his creation, whether in heaven or on earth. We know that angels, um, including uh, the sons of God, were given areas of dominion and responsibility. And I've done uh, whole videos on that in the past, and I will leave a link to one of uh, those videos too about angels. All right, so angels have dominion over water. Revelation 16, 5, I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is, who was, for you brought these judgments. There is an angel who has authority over fire. Revelation 14, 18, there are angels, sons of God, who were placed over nations, individual nations, to watch over them. And we're going to talk about this in a little more detail in a minute. Uh, Daniel 10 20 he talks about uh, the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece these are uh, princes they're they're over principalities territories actual earthly territories that we have attached the names of nations to and we know that Michael is the prince who is over the nation of Israel there is a uh, the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, and that's the ruler of this present uh, world that we are living under right now. He is the prince of this world, 
And uh, we also know that there is a, a prince or God of this age. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay, so God also has um, a divine counsel. And again, I credit Michael Heiser for bringing this out to the forefront as something that needs to be dealt with in terms of eschatology, although I'm not sure that he would necessarily have seen how how keenly this plays into end times and God's eternal plan. It's really big. So God actually rules the universe uh, through a divine counsel and through delegating responsibility to, like, say, angels, right? So the current divine counsel consists of spiritual beings called the Elohim, or the sons of God. And they act as advisors to God, believe it or not. They also implement his will. They exercise responsibilities over various domains and they're engaged in decision making. Okay, and the reason why this is important is because someday the church believers are going to replace the current divine council. And we're gonna be doing all these same things acting as God's advisors, implementing his will, exercising responsibility over various domains, and we're going to be engaged in decision making. Okay, and this is something that my husband Tom and I have talked about in our series um, on the Shepherd's Heart, which you can watch on Rumble, or you can uh, view it on our Discord uh, server, A Little Outpost of Heaven. And this is the kind of stuff we talk about, and the importance of the church or the, the ecclesia gathering together is so we can uh, learn how to do these things. We can be taught in decision making, in exercising responsibility, in thinking spiritually about things and being engaged in this, okay, as, as God's sons. So sometime before the creation of man, Satan fell. And he took with him an undisclosed number of angels. We have no idea how many. And even though the angels fell and they were no longer operating with God's interests at heart, God did not remove these angels from their positions of dominion. He didn't. He didn't remove them from their areas of responsibility. So God still has fallen angels, including Satan, as members of his council which is like mind blowing. So there were actually some sons of God who lost their positions. And these are the ones who forfeited their role as basically watching over humanity, being, being a watcher because of the sin that they committed, which was basically marrying human women and having children with them. They actually were placed in a holding tank in the pit or the abyss or Tartarus. There's various names for it until the time of the end because uh, because what they did was so egregious that they were placed in in the, in the pit in Tartarus. So they did lose their position and then presumably some other angelic being or son of God took their place. Some other um, angel was given assignment as being part of a principality or overseeing what um, they were supposed to be doing. But, but it's a very curious thing that the fallen angels are still part of God's counsel. They're still working with God. They're still um, having to uh, <laughs> be a part of that. They're still in God's presence periodically. During the end times, God's plan is that they be replaced. And they're, they'll be replaced like uh, by us. So an Elohim is simply a class or kind of spirit being who exercises dominion. God is Elohim. Um, an angel is a spirit being or Elohim. A spiritual son of God, a watcher. These are all Elohim. They're all gods in that they are spirits who have dominion or authority. So Psalm 82, 1. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods or the Elohim. He holds judgment. Psalm 95, 3. For Yahweh, the Lord, is a great God, El, 
and a great king above all gods or all Elohim. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, 17, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and a Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribes. And Psalm 89, 5 through 7, The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness as well. And the assembly of the holy ones, for who in the skies can compare with the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared and awesome above all who surround him. Okay, so the divine council exists for a number of reasons, as I mentioned before. And one reason is to engage in problem solving. And here is where we sort of get a hint that some of these angels who are part of God's council or part of his advisors are not necessarily what we would call holy or good angels. So this is from 1 Kings 22, verses 19 through 22. And um, this is uh, during the days of Ahab, and there is a battle that's about to take place. So a prophet of God is called in to basically prophesy how this battle is going to go. A bunch of other prophets have already been called in, and they're saying, oh yeah, this is all going to be great. You're going to be fine. Everything's going to go awesome for you. You're going to win. And this other guy, Micaiah, um, was a prophet who was a real prophet of God. Anyway, Micaiah, uh, came in and at, at first he's like uh yeah you don't want to really you really don't want to hear what i have to say and and they go yeah we really don't because you only say bad things but tell us what what you think god is saying so micaiah continued therefore hear the word of the lord i saw the lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left and the lord said who will entice ahab to march up and fall at ramoth gilead and one suggested this, and another that. And then a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. By what means? asked the Lord. And he replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouths of all his prophets. You will surely entice him and prevail, said the Lord. Go and do it. All right, so... I leave it to you to decide whether this spirit was a good spirit or a bad spirit, but he uh, was going to be a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets. That's interesting to me. That's very interesting that a spirit would come forward to God and say, you know what, I got a skill here and it's lying and I'm a good liar. I can communicate a, a lying message to these prophets that'll sound really good and people will believe it. They'll, they'll believe it, and they'll go out to battle. And God said, okay, go ahead and do it. So this is super interesting how God even uses evil for his um, furthering his purpose and for ultimately for his glory. Let's go on to another area here of, of dominion or responsibility. According to Deuteronomy, God divided up the nations according to the sons of God. After the Tower of Babel incident, the sons of God were given responsibility and authority over individual nations of the earth. All right, so this is a different group of sons of God than the ones who intermarried with human women prior to the flood. The Tower of Babel came after the flood. This is uh, the Tower, it's after the Tower of Babel, after the nations were uh, divided up because of languages, there's a spiritual uh, hierarchy here, and some angels are over nations. Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided the, the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of God. So when, when it talks about the Most High giving nations their inheritance, it's about them having their allotted land, their territory. We're talking about territory here. So they were divided up and he set boundaries, of uh, territorial boundaries. And these uh, sons of God, these uh, angels, part of the Elohim, were given authority over various groups of people. Now, were all of these good sons of God, were they all 
wonderful? Uh, chances are no, but these didn't violate that um, command that angels aren't supposed to reproduce other angels. They violated this this law of God's, and there there was a punishment for that to be thrown into the pit or the uh, Tartarus. So basically what happened was that the sons of God became equated with the territorial gods of the nations, and that most of them were re rebels. They rebelled against the Lord. So let's take a look at Exodus 18, 9 through 11. This is um, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, is speaking to him. And Jethro rejoiced over all the good things the Lord had done for Israel, whom he'd rescued from the hands of the Egyptians. And Jethro declared, Blessed be the Lord, who's delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who's delivered the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. For he did this when they treated Israel with arrogance. So the gods of the nations actually wield spiritual power. Uh, we, we tend to think of them as not existing, that there's only one God and there are no other, you know, little g kinds of gods. But that is not the teaching of scripture. As you can see here, there are little g, small g, lowercase g gods um, because God has a hierarchy and he delegates authority and that's what's been going on here and he's still using fallen angels in various positions and you, even though this sounds crazy he does he is still using these angels in their positions they haven't lost those positions because basically the people or the the new people the the new uh, the new group who's going to be filling those positions hasn't quite come into existence yet not fully so the gods of the nations actually exist they do have power they do have spiritual power and they do um, influence nations on the earth um, including the uh, the destiny of nations so uh, Daniel uh, chapter 10 verses 12 and 14 talks about some of these territorial gods and the extent of their power do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you proposed to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. However, the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days, and then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision concerns those days. So the prince of Persia is not an earthly prince in the sense that he's a person. He was a spiritual, territorial power, principality, who uh, is over um, an archon, basically over this principality. So periodically, the sons of God have to give an account of themselves to God, what they're doing. And Satan is actually one of these sons of God. And so he also has to give an account to God and he has boundaries within which he can operate. Job 1, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So anybody who teaches that Satan's been cast out of heaven, that that has already happened, they're incorrect. Satan has not been cast out of heaven yet. He still has access to God. At the time of, of um, Job, he still had access to God. He still does to this very day, which is one of the reasons why Jesus is in heaven right now interceding for us. If Satan wasn't there, we wouldn't need the Lord to be there as our high priest. And though the nations are ruled by lesser gods, the Most High God reserved the nation of Israel for himself, and he appointed Michael as the prince of Israel. Daniel 10, 21. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So I'm just going to set that idea of the sons of God, the fallen sons of God, um, the Elohim, who are part of the divine council, the principalities over nations. We'll just put that aside for just a minute. I want to talk about Israel, the nation of Israel. Uh, we know that other sons of God, other princes over other territories, other principalities are over other nations. 
but God reserved Israel for himself. And this is what he says in Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. Now, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession out of all the nations, for the whole earth is mine. And unto me you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. Also Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. So God reserved this one group of people, uh, the sons of Jacob, Israel, and this group of people also has a territory on the earth, their allotted boundary, which is the nation, the actual ground of Israel. It's the place. And this is God's portion because these are his people, the Israelites, who are to live in this location. Now, one thing that God did say is that if Israel was disobedient and they were rebels, they would be vomited out of the nation just like the the Canaanites were um, eventually vomited out of the land. They, they couldn't be there anymore and God uh, brought his people in the uh, nation of Israel. And periodically the, the Jews were like put into exile or taken out like when Assyria came and took uh, the nation, the northern uh, ten tribes uh, into captivity and then later on uh, Judah was carried into Babylon and then brought back 70 years later. They're um, being exiled from God's land is is a very big deal. Okay, let's just keep going. God's intention really was to rule the world and bless the world through the nation of Israel. They were to be the conduit of blessing to the nations. Now, Jesus made a curious statement about the Elohim status of Israel and sort of by extension, all of humanity. This is super interesting and we, we don't really talk about it. It's not a teaching that's out there, but Jesus was pretty clear about this. And as we will look in uh, other passages in a minute, and we will actually sort of expand on what Jesus is saying here. In John 10, 34, Jesus said this, verses 34 through 36. Jesus answered them. These are the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests and the Jewish leaders. Is it not written in your law I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. So Jesus called these people uh, Elohim. He called them Elohim. You are gods. That's what the Bible says. That's what he was telling them. This is what the word of God says. It says you are gods. And Jesus said, I'm just saying I'm the son of God. But the Bible says you are gods. Psalm 82, 6. I said you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. All of you, sons of the most high. So here's the question now. What was Jesus communicating about the godlike status of people, particularly the nation of Israel. Jesus is saying that people are gods. People are Elohim. People have a godlike status. How does that work? In, in what way? How, what, is, what does Jesus mean when he's saying to, to them, and really by extension to all of us, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. So let's take a look at the very beginning of the creation of mankind. Uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Okay, dominion. 
over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, this is worthy of a Bible study all on its own. I'm not going to be able to do that today. But the image of God is both male and female. Both male and female components are part of the image of God. And being in God's image means that man has a spiritual component to him. Man is not just made of the dust of the ground. He's made of the dust of the ground, but there is a spiritual component to man, which is why he's an Elohim. Because remember, Elohim are spiritual beings who have dominion. Hebrews 2, 5 through 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. And this is a quote from Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8. You made him, that is, you made man a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler of the works of your hands. You've placed everything under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that swims in the paths of the sea. So man is a spiritual being. He is created in the image of God. He is an Elohim. He is a son of God. And man was given dominion. This is part of the godlike status, is to rule over something, to have an area of dominion or responsibility. Now, it's important to understand that even though the angels, the sons of God, the Elohim, uh, were part of God's heavenly family, they were not created in his image. It never says about an angel or a a heavenly son of God, that they are in the image of God. It never says that. They're spirit beings, but they're not in the image of God, whereas man is, which is a an incredible thing. Even though man is a little lower than the other Elohim, in an org chart, if you were going to look at an organizational hierarchi hierarchical chart, man is under the angels. But yet, we are the ones who are created in the image of God. And we're going to take a look at what part of that image is and what it involves here in, in just a minute. So to, to reiterate this, man and only man was created in the image of God and given dominion over the earth and everything in it. Neither the angels nor the sons of God nor any other heavenly creature or created being, was created in the image of God. And none of them were given dominion over the earth. None of them. And man, as an image bearer, was something totally unique in ages past. Okay, Up until the creation of man during this age, okay, this had never happened before. This had never happened before where man was created in the image of God. So what are we talking about here? Well, one of the things that we're talking about is the ability to reproduce, create other Elohim, other spiritual entities. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, man was created in the image of God. God breathed into man the, the breath of lives. He breathed into man. He imparted something of himself into Adam when he created Adam in uh, Genesis 2. And this union of male and female, which are also part of the image of God, were given the power, the ability, and the command to be fruitful and multiply. God, in essence, was telling the man and the woman to have children, be fruitful and multiply, and reproduce after their kind. And 
As a team, the man and the woman would exercise this unique godlike ability to create other Elohim, other spiritual beings. We live in a world that regularly aborts babies, that doesn't, um, you know, infanticide is something that happens, that children are not valued, um, where uh, reproductive rights includes killing babies. And this is all from the enemy. This is de definitely a sat satanic agenda because God planned that people would partner with him in the creation of more Elohim, more gods. Okay, I'm not a Mormon. Okay, by the way, I'm not a Mormon. I'm just taking what's in the scriptures here and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it and it sounds kind of shocking, but it's the truth. Whenever you have a child, when a child is born, they are an eternal being. They're not like, you know, a fish or a bird or some creature that has a soul, but it's not an Elohim. It's not a spirit. We actually have an eternal spirit inside of us. Well, it, it's what we are. It's our essence. And we have the ability to create more, more spiritual beings. Where prior to the creation of man and woman in the image of God, all life, spiritual life, was created individually. Every angel was an individual creation. Every son of God was an individual creation. But now we are in the image of God and we're partnering with God and as husband and wife creating more Elohim. It's, it's just shocking when you think about it and the, and the level of responsibility here. God gave this command and this ability to create more Elohim to mankind in the very beginning. And he's never rescinded this command. And with for all the belly aching and everything about the earth running out of resources, about um, the earth being overcrowded, God never said that that was going to be a problem. So people would reproduce after their kind. Animals would reproduce after their kind. Every, every offspring was made in the image of the mother and the father. So babies, every baby that's born from the very first baby, Cain, uh, and then later Abel and Seth, were basically spiritual beings, other Elohim who are made in the image of God who could also reproduce other Elohim in their image. Here's where it gets interesting, the implications. And I guess this is where spirit, the spiritual implications are, are pretty, pretty impressive. If mankind kept reproducing, more and more Elohim would be born, right? Eventually, it's possible that all of Satan's fallen angels would be outnumbered by, by us. That we would outnumber Satan and all his fallen angels. And then what would happen? Would we replace them? Was that the plan? Well, that was the plan. That was the plan, was for them to, to be replaced. And this was part of the goal, was to create sons of God who would eventually replace the fallen ones in heaven right now with uh, people, um, with other sons of God, other divine spiritual sons who would obey and respect and love and worship and honor him. Okay, so this was God's eternal intention was that man would participate in this creation of more spirit beings, um, spiritual sons of God. So this is where Satan sort of fell into uh, the trap. There was a trap that was laid for Satan here. And he, and he couldn't see it, and he may still not see it in its entirety. I don't know. What Satan and the fallen angels understood about man made in the image of God, they understood that man 
even though he had a body of dust, of the dirt of the ground, he actually was a spirit being who was wearing an earth suit, okay, a body of dust. He was essentially a spirit being, an Elohim wearing a dust suit. And if you have this body of dust with a spirit inside of it, you can rule the earth. You can have dominion. And I've said this over and over again, the earth is the prize. They want the earth. Everybody wants the earth. Eventually, God's going to live on the earth with us. The earth is the thing, okay? It's the it right now. So what Satan and the fallen sons of God did was they decided that they were going to kind of do the same thing, create a hybrid, which is what we are. Right now, that's what we are. We have bodies like the animals made of the dust of the ground, but we have a spirit inside of us we have God's uh, we have a we have a spirit that's inside of us when we become saved or we become a Christian God's spirit comes to live inside of us and basically ignites this um, what was considered a dead spirit in that it didn't have it was separated from God it it puts it back into a right relationship with God again that's what the new birth does but what Satan and the fallen ones wanted to do was to create their own hybrids, their own combo of spirits that live in bodies that are three-dimensional, made of the dust of the ground. And they also understood from what God had said, if man ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, well, he would die that day. Okay, that's one thing that would happen. Now, we know that that didn't happen that day. Death entered the world, but not that day. God covered them with the skins of a, of, a, of a lamb or a goat that indicated something had to be sacrificed. Some blood was slain so that they could have a covering, which is um, where we get the word atonement. They had clothing. They were clothed with the death of, of somebody else. This is our first idea of the substitutionary death. It's hinted at in Genesis but what God said to the serpent was, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is a prophecy about Christ, really, and the Antichrist, that the seed of the woman, a, a person would be born from the woman, that person would bruise the head of the serpent. Okay, so here we're getting some kind of idea that it's the seed of the woman who is going to do this. So let's corrupt the seed of the woman, I'm sure is what one of the things Satan thought. And also, if he could get and interject his spiritual DNA, as it were, into humanity, that he could co-opt this whole thing. What they realized was that man was essentially a hybrid a spiritual being wearing an earth suit, and they thought they could um, thwart God's plan by creating their own version of Elohim, their own champion, their own Christ, okay? And eventually, if they worked it right, they would eventually outnumber, overpower, and usurp dominion of the earth from humanity altogether. And of course, this is what was attempted prior to the flood. Some of these sons of God assumed human form and had children by the daughters of men. And we can read about that in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And we also read that not only did this happen prior to the flood, it also happened afterward. Eventually, the earth was filled with these Nephilim, these half-breeds, these um, giants, these earth-born. And the earth was filled with violence on account of the Nephilim. And this race of usurpers, uh, hybrids, pitted themselves against true humans in an effort to totally annihilate this race of image bearers, the image of God. And the Nephilim were so successful with their interbreeding and their actually actual destruction of people that with the exception of Noah and his family, the world was actually overrun and overtaken by the Nephilim. The sons of God who mated with human women eventually 
made it so that there were only eight people on the earth who were not a part of this other hybrid weird race. The sons of God who fathered those mutant Nephilim were chained into the pit and into Tartarus and they await their judgment during the end times. Jude verse 6. And the angels who did not stay within their own domain but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he's kept in eternal chains under darkness, bound for judgment on that great day. So even though the original sons of God were placed in chains in Tartarus, there were actually more incursions after the flood. Uh, when the Israelites entered the promised land, they were commanded to destroy all the inhabitants of the land. And why was that? It was because the inhabitants were infected with the genome of fallen Elohim because it happened all over again. So Numbers 13, 32, and 33 tells us this. This is about the spies who were sent in to spy out the land. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. All right, in the next section, we're going to talk about genealogies and the importance of being able to tra trace one's genealogy to Adam. Um, at least in, the, in, the, in biblical days, this was an important thing, that you actually could trace your genealogy to Adam, who was made in the image of God.